This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998, Ash, and Team Valor. We resume not long after we left, as following Barry's schooling at the hands and fins of Ash and his new relicanth, the gang have decided to stay in the Crown Tundra for a bit, in order to use their downtime to take advantage of the intense environment for some hardcore training despite Caitlin pointing out how oxymoronic such a notion is. Regardless of contradictions, this time serves as an important moment for Ash to take stock while getting to know everything there is about his newest team members Electrode and Relicanth, as well as getting attuned to Garchomp and Zoroark's new forms, allowing him and his team's overall synchronicity to increase. For instance, through bonding with Electrode, he comes to find it very much as the spirit of a true guard Growlithe, as it is simultaneously eager to play, now that it has a dedicated trainer to give it affection and attention, but is also very protective, as its time as a booby trap for Hunter J now seems to Ash like something the Electrotype was doing not only out of a genuine appreciation for the art of standing guard, but possibly as merchandise itself. As with enough antics in training, Ash comes to learn that Electrode has the rare ability Aftermath, making it prone to still releasing small-scale detonations when it's exhausted or defeated, even though it does not know self-destruct or explosion. On the other hand, Relicanth is a much easier rhythm and ethos to learn, as his father sums things up fairly perfectly when it comes to longevity Pokemon. As per its classification and Brandon's description, the ancient fish is pretty much just a very crotchety old man, having made it this far in life serving as both a testament to its wisdom and tenacity, while also making it hard-headed and set in its ways. In simpler terms, a Pokemon with a disposition that could range from that of Ash himself to his dad when he's particularly stubborn or strict about something. In turn, this feeds Ash's confidence, as it serves as a reminder of his bond with his father, and a sign that the man will always have his back and be there pushing him forward into the next challenge or adventure, no matter how far apart they are or how old he may grow. Meanwhile, the aforementioned newly evolved duo of Garchomp and Zoroark have taken to sparring together, as with so much raw untapped power, they need all the strong training partners they can get while getting accustomed to the changes they've undergone. With this seeing Ash's other veteran team members such as Melton and Chimchar working just as hard to help their companions. With this inspiring not only Barry and Caitlin, but also Paul to help as well, with a purple head you taking just as much advantage of the environment and training partners to continue building off what Brandon has taught him. This change in behaviour, while clear for all to see, is most obvious to Chimchar as a former teammate, with the Fire Monkey greatly approving and encouraging Paul in his efforts, even allowing him to command it during practice battles against Garchomp, with the two managing to control Blaze together as Chimchar and Ash did in their battle, giving Paul some closure in return for the closure said battle gave Chimchar. It is during one of these lively and active spas that something new is born, as in the midst of a double battle against Ash's Electrode and Chimchar, and Paul's Electabuzz and Magmar, the two sides suddenly realise their icy battlefield is actually someone's napping place, as thanks to all the heat they've generated, they accidentally melt all the snow a large white Aphrod Pokemon had been sleeping quite comfortably under, seeing it awaken crankily, as its large snow fro has been burned thanks to these interlopers. Taking the blame for this mistake, it is Chimchar who rushes up first to apologise to the fellow Simeon Pokemon, seeing Ash and Paul call off their training bout, so Ash can get a burn heal from referee Samuel. Though when he returns, things are quite chaotic, as now there is a lot more fire than before. As while the obviously ice-type Pokemon has calmed down and stopped going berserk from its burn, its afro has taken on the appearance of a hellish snowman, which bears a searingly high temperature flame as a nose rather than a carrot. This finally allows Ash to identify it as a Galarian Darmanitan and a rather eccentric and carefree one at that, as it seems to find everyone's shock funny, as it attempts to spook Ash by flaring its flame nose when he steps in to apply the medicine, only to good-naturedly apologise after its prank, since it truly meant no harm. Following this, Darmanitan becomes fast friends with Chimchar, who as a fellow fire type can certainly at least see the humour in their new friend's style of comedy, meaning Darmanitan winds up sticking around the group for a large portion of their stay in the tundra, clearly becoming endeared to Ash and his team. After a few days of this, Paul finally gives the ultimatum to go ahead and catch the happy Lucky like Gorilla, or he will, with Darmanitan showing its approval of the idea by excitedly beating the snowy ground in its chest, seemingly urging Ash to make it official already, with the young man happily doing so, expanding his team to seven. However, instead of having any form of dilemma or anguish over the choice he's now faced with as a trainer of more than six Pokemon, Ash just casually walks back over to referee Samuel to give him Chimchar's Pokeball, therefore putting in the possession of Ash's official sponsor Brandon, meaning that as soon as Darmanitan and Chimchar are split up, the two buddies are reunited, with Barry balking since Ash's home Pokemon storage being a literal flying pyramid is a loophole in the rules that's worth a life-changing amount of fines. Though Ash defends it's not as though he's always next to his house, so Barry should just quietly allow him to enjoy this while he can. Thanks to the trio turned quartet being inside the pyramid as they discuss all of this, they are privy to Brandon and Peony watching something rather intensely on TV, with it turning out to be an advert for the Sinnoh League's Lily of the Valley Conference, which is apparently only two short weeks away. 
As a result, there isn't a lot of discussion between Master and Disciple before Brandon decides it's high time the group head back for the sake of Paul being able to finish his gym challenge on time. And beyond this, the boys can't put off completing their Battle Frontier challenge forever, even if he does admire their dedication to preparation. Thus, though it means they'll have to part ways with Gala before they've truly explored its beauty, as well as from Peony, as he must attend to some family business as one of his daughters has just come home from boarding school on a sabbatical, the journey must continue on, with everyone saying a heartfelt goodbye to the orange-clad man. However, having come to look up to the Galarian explorer as a mentor of his own, Barry is the saddest to see Peony go, with his farewell understandably being the most passionate, promising to find the former champ if he doesn't come and visit them soon, while the master of the Dynamax band cheekily challenges Barry to hurry up and become a frontier brain already, so he can be the first to battle him for his symbol. And so with waves and warm smiles, our heroes board and take off in the Battle Pyramid, where a few hours later they find themselves crossing the border into Sinnoh near the Battle Tower, since Paul vehemently refuses to miss what will be the final battles of Ash and Barry's Frontier Challenges one way or the other. Happy to be back home in spite of this dire reminder, Barry wastes no time in taking off when the pyramid lands, not even waiting for the entrance ramp to extend to the ground, instead simply sliding down the extending plank before switching to a run as he sprints into the Battle Tower, kicking up a cloud of dust which he goads Ash to eat while Caitlin in turn yells that he could have broken his neck by pulling a stunt like that, as she and Ash take off after him in a much safer fashion by simply teleporting. Thanks to quickly popping into the tower, they're treated to the sight of Barry reuniting with his dad as the pair share a hug, warming their hearts, for Ash is reminded he's acted too slow, since Barry confidently lays out his challenge to his dad while they embrace. Grinning widely, Palmer accepts, having apparently been awaiting this with as much anticipation as Barry has, with his soon seeing Ash, Caitlin, Paul and Brandon in the stands, watching on as Barry his father square off, while he is reminded of the rules of the battle tower, being a best of three. As the tower tycoon, Palmer chooses his Pokemon first, with this being none other than the Pokemon he used against Brandon in their exhibition, Milotic. A wave Barry is more than happy to ride, as it means he can get his first win with his starter, as he chooses Empoleon. Eyeing up the prideful penguin, Palmer praises that it's grown a lot from the little piplup who used to chase Barry around the tower. He just hopes the same can be said of his son. With the boy in turn grinning that he's come a long way from that little kid who used to watch his dad battle, now he's ready to face him as an equal. He then attempts to set the tempo by going first with Steelwing. Though knowing his son well, Palmer perfectly predicts Barry's desire to start off fast, and so makes a move to slow him down by having Milotic unleash a powerful icy wind that after all that time in a tundra, Barry nearly mistakes for a blizzard. However, in a testament to his growth and mile a minute thinking, he does not freeze, but instead adapts, converting their steel wing attack into a steel wing shield to stave off the worst of this, before retaliating with Bubble Beam to use the same strategy against his father. Unfortunately, this is unwise for a multitude of reasons, such as Milotic's shared water typing and serpentine body allowing it to resist and avoid the stream of high pressure bubbles easily, but mostly because the use of this special based move is the requirement needed for Milotic to activate a mirror coat, which allows it to coil around Napoleon's attack, before reflecting it back with a bit of springiness from its body for extra force, once again forcing a use of Steel Wing to defend. Thankfully, Barry was not bluffing about having learned a lot, as drawing on his companion's analytical frame of thinking, he realizes that Empoleon's other moves can't trigger Mirror Coat, and so goes back to his first instinct of wanting to get in close, having Empoleon combine all its high level moves in Peck, Steel Wing, and Aqua Jet to help close the distance. With this high level combination proving effective in allowing Empoleon to slide in and approach without fear of Milotic's Scald and Icy Wind attacks, as thanks to the coating of water, armament of steel, and cutting power of the Emperor Penguin's sharp beak, Milotic is unable to either burn or slow them down. To add to this, each blow carries the damage of three moves in one, making every land to hit a significant one, driving Milotic back and forcing it to regain its footing so to speak, leaving it open for a follow up attack that Barry is happy to provide, putting his hasty nature to good use as he does not let up for a second until finally Milotic is left exhausted and unable to battle. As his first win is declared, Barry almost can't believe it. For a moment there, after all the setbacks and mistakes in his journey, he'd truly begun to wonder if maybe he was just a side character in the story of cooler and smarter people like Ash and Caitlin. But right here, right now, this is his story and he's the main character. Wanting to celebrate this with the gusto it deserves, he and Empoleon high-five and strike matching confident poses, promising to keep the train rolling by getting a second win in a row to earn a flawless victory over the Tower Tycoon. Palmer in turn can only respond to this boast with boisterous laughter, as while he is proud of Barry, that doesn't mean he's gonna let the kid win, since then he'd get a big head. To this end, his next choice is one Barry will not have such an easy time knocking off its feet, the titanic tank Rhyperia. Seeing the hulking beast of his father's team sporting its shiny solid rock armor, Barry can't help but gulp audibly as he may have used Empoleon a bit early, but even so, the plan ain't about to change, since his newest team member is ready to 
to make its debut, as he calls out a large rocky creature that bears a hefty load of burning coal on its back, which Caitlin and Paul identify for Ash as the colossal Barry Court when they went on the Max Raid with Peony. For a moment, Ash doesn't speak. Then, as a small smile forms in his face, he wishes his rival luck, excited to see what Relicant's equivalent can accomplish in this battle. With the start of Match 2 called, Father and Son once again start off in nearly identical ways, as Palmer calls for an earthquake and Barry for a scold. With this seeing Palmer's rocky titan stomp hard, causing the ground to shake violently, the spikes of earth begin shooting out of the field and racing towards Barry's side, while at the same time, Colossal Scald bursts forward, its heat and water pressure clearing away about half of the spikes, reducing the oncoming damage and causing the battlefield to fog up, greatly hampering Palmer and Rhyperia's ability to see. Gloatingly, Barry calls this his own version of Sandstorm, having always been a fan of the move from watching Rhyperia do it as a kid, and just like Sandstorm, this move is part of a combo that's going to take his dad down. He then calls for a barrage of tar shots, using the cover of the steam to prevent Rhyperia from dodging, as it does not know which direction they're coming from, seeing the draw Pokemon soon coated in gunky flammable goo, as Colossal closes in unimpeded, even slipping past the Ice Punch Palmer orders as a defensive maneuver by lobbing some of its coal into the air, resulting in the Tower Tycoon jumping the gun and allowing Barry to bring his carefully laid plan to fruition, as he orders a Heat Crash, which slams home without any resistance, resulting in a massive explosion that the blonde boy hopes will be enough to end things thanks to Tower Shot doubling the power is fire type move. However, when the smoke clears, there Rhyperia stands, blackened by the soot of the explosion, but undeniably still conscious, and with Colossal in such close range now, there is little it can do to avoid the rock ground type's next attack, a quite effective earthquake. Desperately, Barry cries for a rock polish in the hopes this will boost Colossal's speed enough to avoid the attack, but it is entirely too late, as the quaking of the ground stuns Colossal, and leaves it vulnerable for Hyperia to place a hand onto its chest, in a gesture of recognition for its strength and endurance, though this is not to say it will show any mercy, as a moment later, the draw Pokemon unleashes a point-blank rock wrecker that takes out the fire rock type, tying up the match at one win apiece. In spite of its loss, Barry praises Colossal, stating that it more than proved itself worthy of the battle frontier, returning it to its ball, while at the same time feeling the pressure rising. This next match is his last chance, as depending on how it goes, he will either achieve his lifelong dream of becoming a frontier brain, or he will fall at the final hurdle, and all his struggles will have been for nothing. Perhaps due to reading his mind, or simply because she cannot pass up an opportunity to scorn Barry, Caitlin chooses that moment to pipe up, stating that she told him using his newest capture wouldn't work out with only a week or two of solid training, before adding that she had suggested to use Chatot. This in turn sees the duo descend into their most heated argument yet, until Brandon tells them to stop, reminding them both there is a battle going on. Strangely enough, this serves to ease Barry's mind in exactly the way he needs, since it's a reminder that win or lose, the sun is going to rise tomorrow, and he and Caitlin are going to bicker like Lillipop and Glamiao. With this in mind, he decides to bet all his hopes and dreams on Shogun as his pick for match 3 since he already knows his father's final Pokemon is going to be Dragonite, so he might as well mirror his typing one last time. As the final bout is called to begin, Barry wastes no time calling for Draco Meteor, since it's his and Shogun's best weapon in this match, and its first use will be the most surprising and powerful. Thanks to this, Palmer and Dragonite are actually caught off guard, with the Orange Dragon taking several strikes from a few of the Draconic Asteroids, before Palmer responds by having Dragonite boost its power and speed with Dragon Dance, allowing it to evade and fly away from the very worst of Shogun's attack. This is bad news for Barry, as Draco Meteor comes at the cost of weakening the user, meaning Shogun will now have to fight with reduced power while Dragonite's is heightened. Not that the boy is complaining, as he cheers out to his dad that he really is the coolest guy ever, and that he's glad he doesn't have to find him for going easy on him. Grinning, Palmer replies that he wouldn't dream of it. Barry worked hard to get where he is, and deserves the same challenge as any opponent, so while he loves his son dearly, he will not disrespect him with anything less than his all, even if that means crushing his dreams. He then attempts to make good on this promise with a barrage of fire and thunder punches that Shogun is forced to either endure, or attempt to protect against, while using the brief moments between the flying drake swoops to launch as many Draco meteors as it can. However, with only four uses of the move left, this is a desperate strategy made worse by the fact that each usage further weakens Shogun, to the point where soon Dragonite doesn't even bother to dodge, as their damage is negligible. Then, when the last set of Meteors is launched, Dragonite strikes back with a super effective move of its own, Outrage. Though unlike the one Garchomp used, this one comes in the form of a brutal pitch as Dragonite grabs the falling stones, recharges them with Draconic Energy, and lobs them back at Shogun for much fiercer damage than they would have done against the Dragon Flyer. Desperately, Barry begs Shogun to manifest one last Protect, even though they have used it so many times already, though unfortunately, this fails, only succeeding in trapping Shogun in a dome that suddenly implodes on the second stage pseudo-legendary, at which point Palmer's referee, as any reasonable person would, prepares to call the match in the Tower Tycoon's favour. 
However, before he can, the blonde-haired father and son cry out in unison, stealing Brandon's favourite word and rebuking the ref as they see something brewing in the smoke. Then suddenly, as a mighty roar reverberates through the battle tower, a large red and blue creature rises from the dust and debris, having achieved its primal goal of taking to and conquering the skies as a fearsome salamence. Shocked that Lady Luck decided to smile just as soon as she frowned, Barry doesn't give up hope, now willing to fight with Incinerate alone. However, with its special attack power gone, Salamence's natural instinct is of course to use its new stronger body, going so far as to manifest a new move to replace Headbutt by focusing all its power into its claws, resulting them beginning to glow and extend for a dangerous looking dragon claw. Thanks to Dragonite having used Outrage, it can think of nothing but meeting this fellow Drake in a clash. However, for once in this battle, cooler heads prevail, as with a clean flourish that both Derek and Peony would be proud of, Barry orders Salamence to suck its wings in and dive, forcing Dragonite's attack to miss as a result of the change in pace, and leaving the orange dragon open to be slashed critically across its soft underbelly with Dragon Claw, knocking it out of the sky and sending it skidding across the ground face first, while Salamence is just barely able to come to a halt and stand up, seeing Barry declared the winner and ending his battle frontier run in triumph. For once, Barry is too stunned to speak, though his father quickly snaps him out of it by running up to him and pulling him into another hug, yelling loudly at how proud he is of him and asking his referee to go and call Scott immediately. Getting his bearing back as his friends soon join them on the battlefield, and Salomon stomps over menacingly only to nuzzle lovingly against him, Barry is still a bit too dazed to answer immediately when his dad asks him the same question the Frontier Chairman will, would he like to become a Frontier Brain? Looking to Caitlin and Ash, Barry is filled with more confidence and self-esteem than he's ever felt before before, because he can see that his friends clearly believe he is ready for this, and so with a broad smile, he happily tells his dad that he will. He will become a frontier brain. Needless to say, after such a momentous occasion and tough battle, everyone wants to celebrate and give both Palmer and Barry's team a chance to rest, with a big dinner and party quickly being arranged. Thankfully, having exhausted himself mentally and emotionally, Barry passes out with a belly full of food before his head can get too big, with Caitlin taking a moment to make fun of his sleeping habits for once. Though sadly, Ash isn't really able to enjoy these jokes, since he is busy preparing for his own match take on Palmer in the morning, since Barry is showing really fired him up, as now more than ever, he bears a similar intensity and focus to Brandon's, as if he has closed in on a treasure he's been seeking all his life. Obviously curious about this, his companions approach him around dawn the following morning to ask which Pokemon he's using and what his strategy may be, with his focus only breaking then and there, as he is all too happy to let them in on his plot, quite casually and matter-of-factly replying that he intends to use his three newest captures, as they've not had a chance to have a frontier battle yet, and this is their last chance. Subsequently, Caitlin, Barry, and Paul once again find themselves questioning how someone so seemingly insane was raised by the disciplined and pragmatic Brandon. Nevertheless, nothing they say is able to sway Ash, so that a a few hours later, just before noon, when Ash stands before Palmer, who once again calls out his Milotic to start off the best of three, Ash truly does answer it with Electrode. Thanks to having watched yesterday, Ash has a decent read on Palmer's battling style, so when he opens with Icy Wind again in the hope of reducing Electrode's speed, it is not surprising. With the boy calmly calling for one of the rare moves Electrode knows in Curse, further dropping its speed as it surges with power that buffs its attack and defense. Drawing inspiration from his son, Palmer changes tack to a Scold, and while it does fuck up the battlefield, it does not achieve a burn, with Ash using the steam cover to his advantage as he calls for another curse. Seeing that Ash is not moving, Palmer takes the initiative, having Milotic use its lithe body to dash around the battlefield, peppering its foe with more scolds that continue doing damage, while Ash sticks to his guns, having Electrode repeatedly curse itself. Finally, when its attack and defense are at their maximum, but its health is dwindling from all the hot water it's been sprayed with, Ash at last goes on the attack, calling for Gyro Ball, a move he learned the effectiveness of from Thornton way back at the start of his journey and which thanks to Electrode's severely cut speed hits like a truck, causing the ensuing skull to bounce right off it as it strikes Milotic and sends it skidding along the battlefield. However, refusing to go down so easily, Palmer tells his friend to use Recover, seeing some of its strength returned, though this is nothing to the revitalization Electrode receives as it uses Rest to fully recover, before waking immediately on Ash's cry, thanks to its alert nature and guard Growlithe disposition. Now back at full health and possessing massive boosts to its physical strength, the ball Pokemon is ready to rumble, with Ash calling for it will certainly be the final move of the match, having devised this move set by watching how Reggie Lecky fought. This move is none other than Supercell Slam, seeing Electrode wreathe itself in condensed electricity as it rolls and bounces to squash Milotic despite its technically slowed state, with this resulting in the water type taking enough volts to knock out a Copperaja, and thus giving Ash the first win in a spectacularly efficient fashion. Not all too surprised at Brandon's son being capable of something like this, Palmer is undeterred when he calls out Dragonite next, at which point Ash chooses Darmanitan, despite 
Despite the fact that he and Dragonite are now faced with an opponent who can deal quite effective damage, neither the Tower Tycoon nor his dragon show any fear. Attempting to take control of the battle thanks to stacking two Dragon Dancers, as Darmanitan is ordered to use the inaccurate Blizzard and Fire Blast. When these both miss, Palmer grins that he'll show Ash what true firepower is, striking the regional variant with a pair of super effective fire punches that force it into Zen mode. However, this is all part of Ash's plan, and the final step to him winning the battle frontier, as thanks to its time in the Crown Tundra, Darmanitan has mastered the move Snowscape, seeing the room rapidly cool despite all the heat Darmanitan produces with its flame nose, while also slowing Dragonite down and giving it no choice but to try and defend from whatever is coming next. Though, try as it might, there is simply no stopping Blizzard in these conditions, with the battle coming to an end ridiculously quickly as an undodgeable Blizzard barrage downs Dragonite after three successive hits, meaning Ash has won two out of three, and with it, his tower print. Turning back to his friends, Ash then answers the question they had been asking that morning, stating that while his new teammates are fresh, they are also all perfectly suited for defeating Palmer, as Milotic is weak to electric moves, while Dragonite and Rhyperia are quad weak to ice and water respectively, meaning even if Darmanitan had been defeated, he had full faith Relicanth could pull off a win. Suddenly, a new voice calls this very clever team composition, as Scott steps into view, having made his way to the battle tower both to congratulate Barry, as well as to watch Ash's battle, in hopes of seeing the same thing. But he guesses he was too late, joking he should have expected nothing less from Brandon's kid. Smiling gratefully, Ash addresses the Frontier boss's earlier comment about team comp, revealing something he only realised the other day. His current on-hand squad is comprised of normal rock, ice, steel, dragon, and electric, meaning that as of now, even if he doesn't have any of his own, he's assembled the six types of the Regis, so in a way, his team should be as good as his dad's from a purely structural lens. Having a hunch he knows where the boy is going with this, Scott tells him to elaborate, with Ash not disappointing, as he states that he doesn't want to accept Scott's offer to join the battle frontier alongside Barry. At least, not yet. Instead, he wants to gamble it all on a full 6v6 with his father, no longer wanting to just be any Frontier brain, he wants to be the Frontier Champion, a challenge Brandon welcomes. And that's where we'll leave things. What twists and turns await Ash heading into this final battle? How will his team stack up to the completed troop of legendary titans? And can our young hero actually overcome his father, making him the strongest Frontier brain of all time? Find out as the journey continues.